Uh, we've been on a, uh, we just started two weeks ago, a uh, series that we call Story Time, because we're looking at the various parables of Jesus. Jesus spoke telling stories. He taught telling stories. And we're going to look at a very short story today, and the message is called, How Deep Is Your Love? The old BG song. How Deep Is Your Love? And today we're going to attend a dinner party. Don't you love when you get invited to dinner? You know, when I was growing up in, in the 60s, when somebody, when a family invited the, the, your family to dinner, it was a big deal. Or if you had people over. You know, it's, it's changed a lot. People don't entertain a whole lot at home anymore. But in those days, they did. And when, so when you went to somebody's house, or if you had people, guests at your house, it, man, you worked, you got that, the, the house was spick and span, you had the nice tablecloth on the table, the table was beautifully set. And it was, it was a special event, and then you got, you wore your nice clothes. And, you know, it was, it was a more formality in those days. It was special. And it was lovely. And uh, I grew up with that kind of thing. Then I came to Las Vegas, and then I found out that a lot of people in the West, they don't know how to really put it together. It has some really ugly dinners out here uh, at people's homes. Not of you. Of course, then you haven't invited me, but uh, <laughs> you. <laughs> pressure's on. <laughs> but you know, as an entertainer for 30 years uh, in the city and all over the world, I've had a lot of incredible dinners. You know, I came from Pennsylvania where it was meat and potatoes and uh, the spices we had were salt and pepper. And uh, so I, I can think of one dinner in, uh, in Bangkok, Thailand. And I was only 23 years old. My sister and brother and I traveled there, and we were doing our act at the top of a hotel called the Dusitani in downtown um, Bangkok. And it was a triangular-shaped building, and the showroom at the top, uh, there were windows all around, so you could see every direction of the city. And we were entertaining uh, European audiences, some English, some from various countries, a lot of businessmen. And some women came in from the American Embassy in Bangkok, and they loved our show because it was very, very American. We did all these impersonations of, of American stars, like Elvis, Barbara Streisand, my sister did Barbara Streisand, not me, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., you know, all these big stars at the time, uh, the Andrews sisters, my brother and I each wore our little whack uniforms along with my sister. And so they, they, these women came in and they were just starved for Americana. And they loved our act, and so the one woman invited us to her home for dinner. And she said, do you like curry? Well, I had some curry on the plane on the way over. And I said, what is this weird taste? Yellowy looking beef. <laughs> and then I had some uh, at a Thai restaurant in the hotel. And oh, that was a weird taste. And I said, well, no, not really. I don't really like it. She said, you'll love the way my Alma makes it, her maid. So we went to this home, very tropical setting, tropical home, and, all, and the other seven women from the American Embassy were there, and my sister and brother, and there was this lovely yellow chicken curry, and you put it on top of rice, and then you put coconut and peanuts and raisins and bananas, and it was, it was really <coughs> fabulous. It got me hooked on good curry. But we were talking about, uh, even though I was only 23 years old, uh, it was right after the Vietnam War, and we were concerned about, I had never, I was the first time I was in, I was a minority. You know, there were all these Thai people and I was, you know, me, you know, white, white and American. And, and uh, but we were, we got to know people, kids that were our age that were working in a hotel and we just fell in love with those people. And we were concerned about not only their spiritual warfare, but uh, welfare, but also whether uh, the communists would move into uh, Thailand, and so these women were kind of fascinated by the fact that we, as young people, would be have any concern in any depth, and not just be playing around and having a good time in Bangkok. So a wonderful, wonderful dinner. And the one other thing about dinner time is when you get together with people, it's just hearing their stories, hearing about their lives, hearing about their adventures. And so today, we're going to attend one of those dinners. Uh, and Jesus is the guest of honor, and Jesus is going to tell us a story. And even though the customs at that time, in the first century in Jerusalem, were, were very unique, uh, different than what you and I uh, experience, if we just kind of put our 21st century American brains on hold and, and go back there, 
we'll hear what Jesus has to say to us by the power of the Spirit. So let's once again come before the Lord and, and ask God to uh, help us receive what He has for us today. Father, we come once again in the name of our Savior and Your precious Son, Jesus. And we ask, Lord, that Your Spirit would speak directly to hearts this morning. Help us to hear what You have for us and then to apply it to our everyday lives. We ask this again in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7. I'll give you a moment. If you have your Bibles and you want to look at it yourself, it will come up on the screen, but it's always good to bring your Bibles because you never know when you want to make a notation. Uh, it just helps you to also locate things and become acquainted uh, with Scripture. So it's Luke chapter 7, and we're going to start in verse 36. Luke 7, 36. Now, one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Throughout Jesus' ministry, we see him being confronted all the time by Pharisees. They were constantly at odds with him, and uh, for good reason. Uh, Jesus' teaching and his healing ministry were drawing multitudes of people toward him. So now the Pharisees, who were the ones that were that the people looked up to, and the people followed, they were now becoming like second and third and fourth fiddle. You know, Jesus was getting attention, so there was jealousy. Every time Jesus exercised divine authority, their credibility and their influence waned. Uh, each time he forgave a sinner, the religious leaders lost their ability to condemn people. Jesus contradicted their teaching. He exposed their pride and their hypocrisy. He rejected their interpretation of Scripture. He exposed the error of their nonsensical traditions. And he even ridiculed them as petulant, spoiled brats. <laughs> Yet, this Pharisee invited Jesus to dinner. Now, <coughs> excuse me, as we read this event... We don't see uh, him necessarily admiring Jesus, but we also don't see him trying to set up Jesus and trap him, as the Pharisees so often were trying to do. And it's likely that this man that we find out, his name is Simon, that he's curious uh, about Jesus, and he wants to show how magnanimous he is by inviting someone who is a religious and a political enemy, basically, to his way of thinking. So we're told that Jesus attends this banquet at this uh, Pharisee's house and he reclines at table. Now, you know, people, we always have this picture because of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper that they were sitting at a table like we're used to and they were all crowded around one side, you know, like you do on sitcoms. Ever notice how they all sit on one side of the table? Uh, it wasn't like that. They, they ate at low tables, almost ground level. And they would then recline and lean on it. You generally have a, a, a cushion, a pillow, and they, they recline on their left arm. Most, of, most people are right-handed. And their feet would then be the opposite direction from the food, which was a nice thing. And then they would eat with their hands. So all, of, all these people at this banquet, they're lying on the floor around this table. They're eating with their hands. And then we read in verse 37... When a woman who had lived a sinful life in that town learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster jar of perfume. And as she stood behind him, at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. This is a strange event. Even back then, that's a strange thing to happen. Can you imagine in the middle of a dinner, something, these kind of weird things happening? Now, I said I've had a lot of dinners throughout my life in various places in the world, but I had a strange dinner experience one time. A friend of mine who uh, was in the show at uh, the Imperial Palace, um, Legends in Concert, he was one of the performers there, and he also was on our worship team. He played flute uh, at the church I was leading worship at. And he bought a new house. It was actually an older home, but it was new to him off uh, Sahara and Valley View in that area of, of old homes. And so he sent out, he wanted to have a dinner housewarming. 
So he sent out these formal invitations in the mail. Remember when you got an invitation in the mail? Oh. Remember when you got thank you notes in the mail? Yes. I know, it's a disappearing art. Now you get a little e email or a little e thing or a little notice on your phone and you miss it half the time if you're older like I am. But he sent these invitations in the mail and announcing this is a date of the uh, housewarming of the dinner. And he listed in the invitation the menu. You're going to have Giuseppe's lasagna and this kind of salad and these kind of rolls and these appetizers. It was very pretentious. And then on the other side, he listed all these musical selections that he and this group of musicians were going to be playing after dinner. You know? So my sister and brother and I were doing a show at the boardwalk where the city, um, city comp, what is that, city, city comp? Center. City center, yeah. <laughs> Every place that I used to perform has been imploded. <laughs> but it used to be. They, they <laughs> could be. <laughs> but anyway, we were performing in this show at uh, the Boardwalk Casino, that was where City Center is. And so we couldn't get to the, the affair right at, at, on time until after our show. So we got to the between shows. We went over to this house and walked in, and there were people everywhere in this place. They were in, it was just a, not a big home, but there were people in the living room, and there were people in the dining area, and there were tons of people in the backyard. There had to be at least 100 people at this thing, and they were grumbling, grumbling, <coughs> because there was no food. Oh. He sent an invitation that had a list of the menu, and we walked through, and I hear women saying, we gotta go, I'm hungry, let's go and eat at Applebee's, and people are complaining. And I walked through the kitchen area to go into the backyard, and after all this hoopla about the menu, here's a, 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 a tray of Stouffer's lasagna, lasagna like that big, and there's a hundred people all over the place. And I don't know if he's expecting Jesus to turn over, turn up and multiply this, but where his thinking was. So we go in the backyard and the people are grumbling. And most of them were church Christian people, you know, but they, they're hungry. They thought they came for dinner and there's no food. So finally, and the appetizers, they were those little pretzels with peanut butter in the middle. So anyway, Finally, somebody must have sent out for some pizza, and in came a stack of like six or seven pizzas. And uh, they, somebody slid open the sliding glass door from the backyard, and the people went in like on a huddle yeah, to get out of this stuff. But, you know, we could you know, try to figure out a dinner party where you invite 100 people and you send out a menu, and then you don't have any food there? That's weird. But this is even weirder. This woman coming in, they've, everybody's banqueting, they're eating, they're having discussion, and this woman walks in, and she's not just any woman. She's known in, in a town where everybody's a sinner. Even these scrub Pharisees, are we're all sinners, right? These scrub Pharisees, they look good, they're dressed well, they speak well, but they're sinners as well. But this woman is known for living a sinful, sinful life. And she walks into the midst of all this and she begins to find her way to Jesus and she falls at his feet and she begins just weeping over him uncontrollably and the tears are falling on his feet and she's wiping them with her hair and she's taking this bottle of pure nard perfume and she's pouring it on his feet sinful sinful woman it says she led a sinful life and when Luke says that it's implying that it was habitual continual sin you know she stood out among sinners she, you know there are good sinners <laughs> and there are real good sinners <laughs> And so she's a real good sinner. And she, it also kind of implies that her sin was very likely of a sexual nature, among all the other things that she probably did. But it doesn't say she's a prostitute, but she may have been a prostitute. We don't know. Luke doesn't tell us. But she probably drank, smoked, played poker machines, and binge watched Keeping Up with the Kardashians. <laughs> Hope I haven't stepped on any toes. Actually, I hope I have stepped on toes. If you watch that kind of junk. 
So in she comes uninvited, and here's this display, and she's weeping, and Martin Luther called her tears heart water. And they're tears of sorrow, and they're tears of repentance, and they're tears of gratitude. And Luke uses the imperfect tense as he's talking about these actions that she's doing, and it's implying that this is going on and on and on. It, it, it wasn't just a minute or two. It was, it was going on and on and on, and at this formal dinner party, it, it's, you know, kind of, it's, just, it's uncomfortable, you know what I mean? It's like when a phone goes off during a sermon, <laughs> and you get all annoyed, a phone's going on, then you realize it's your phone, and you're trying to get, get at it, and you're trying to turn it off, and it's taking forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah. It's that kind of an embarrassing, uncomfortable demonstration, and her actions depict worship, and it's just completely unselfconscious, and it's unrestrained. And her uninhibited weeping indicates this woman knows Jesus <coughs> as her Savior. And I don't know anyone who can know Jesus and not have it accompanied at one time or another by tears. Right. Often at a, at a, when there's an altar call, <coughs> weeping. I think of uh, watching uh, some of the classic Billy Graham um, campaigns. What do they call it? Uh, Crusades. 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 And when he gives that altar call, and they're playing Just As I Am, singing just, and the people are coming down all the years I've known Jesus, it just starts, you get, you get weepy. Yeah. And so many tears. I think of a woman that uh, we knew and have known for many years, and uh, she had a Jewish background, and she came to know Jesus and attended the church where we led worship. And uh, in the first few years of her walk with Jesus, she just sit in the service and the, and the tears. It was such a blessing to just see the, her, see Audrey and see those tears. There's just something in spiritual things that, that tears are involved. Now, not everybody comes to Jesus in tears. Some people come in a very unemotional manner. However you come, Amen. come. it doesn't matter. Just come. Amen. But when you walk with Jesus, when you know Him, when you recognize what He's done for us, the Spirit, Holy Spirit, will move on you, and there will be times of, of tears. I came in tears, I remember, 20 years old, and they were tears of fear. Last week, uh, when Jim Thurber was here, we walked through the Bible, he mentioned fear of God. And how many times we hear that fear of God means reverential Fear. It's just reverence. But no, he pointed out that it means, it means fear. And I remember uh, initially when I came to Jesus, I, had, I came in fear. Because I was dealing with a holy God and I was not fit. And so it, it, was, it was quite frightening. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, this won't come up on the screen because I thought of threw this in yesterday. He said, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body, but not the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's a sobering. And, and that's what the Spirit revealed to me when I first came to the Lord. In Exodus 20, 18 through 20, this is when Moses is leading people, uh, his people through the wilderness. And it says, when the people saw the thunder and lightning, God's power was being demonstrated. When they saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. Now people, that's, when you tremble with fear, that's not just a reverence, a recognition of, of somebody's position, but that's just good old fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Amen. Yeah, remember when you were a kid? I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, 
we were scared of adults, most adults, you know. And some teachers really scared us. And you towed the line with certain ones because you were afraid of them. You didn't want to get out of line, you know. You knew the boundaries, you know. And you knew those people you could get away with certain things. And you knew the ones you didn't dare try to get away. And, and that's the way it is with God. So tears of conversion, and I've had times since then, there were tears of, of relief and gratitude, just times where you come into the Lord's presence, and this woman's in the Lord's presence, and all she can do is weep. Just weep before God. And sometimes, again, the Holy Spirit will just, just move on you a certain way, and I, I don't even know why I'm weeping. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a moment about this, what this woman was doing in worshiping Jesus. Her worship of him was profuse, completely unrestrained. And it showed remarkable humility. You know, this woman's already got a reputation in this city. She knows people look down on her. But she walks into the home of these Pharisees who are looking down on her and, and has no regard for anybody else at the banquet. She just wants to get with Jesus. She just wants to bless Jesus. She just wants to be at his feet. And in the ancient Near, Near East, only the lowest of slaves would wash somebody's feet. That was a custom. If you went into a home where they had servants, the lowest servant would wash people. They walked in their bare feet. They walked in sandals. Their, their feet were dirty, dusty. And so the servant would, as, as a good host, would have the servant wash their feet. It was just part of a tradition. So this woman is doing what only the lowest of slaves would do. And a woman's hair represented her dignity. And a woman never took her hair down in public. Only prostitutes wore their hair down in public. So this woman not only touching Jesus' feet, but putting her hair, using her hair as, as a towel to wipe his feet. It's, it's such humility. And again, it's completely without regard to anybody else. Or she just doesn't care. And finally, concerning the actions of this woman, in Mark's Gospel and in John's Gospel, they make mention of the fact that she's using this perfume made of pure nard. Now, nard came from a plant in uh, India, a spike nard plant. And the oil from that plant uh, was drawn out of that spike nard plant. And then it was very, very costly to import that perfume all the way from India to where they were in Jerusalem. So very, and we're told that, that when she broke that alabaster box, the cost of that perfume was a year's wages. Extravagant. And I'll tell you, the key indicator of our love for Christ is not how often we attend church. It's not how loud we sing, how high we lift our hands, whether we speak in tongues, None of that stuff. It's what you do with your wallet. It's what you do with your checkbook. It's what you do with your finances. Because if God has control of your income, yes. He's got you. Yes. Stephanie and I were at a church a few weeks ago. Uh, a happening place with a lot of millennials, which is beautiful to see people that are in their 20s that are hungry for Jesus. And that pastor made no bones about the fact that Giving is very important. Those people give. That's what keeps the lights on and the sound going and, and provides a place for them to come. And, and I don't talk that often about finances, but I'm going to more and more because, because giving is what blesses you. God so loved the world, I often say, God so loved the world that we all know that John 3.16, that he gave. And we see God giving. And he's put that same ability in us. And often people that, that grew up with not much or were on government assistance and they were taught all their lives that they had to hoard, 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 not give. That's, that's not godly. And, and God's principles are like the woman that gave two mites and Jesus said she gave all that she had. It's, it's a thing of giving. When God gets a hold of your heart, you become a giver. So this woman's a giver, extravagant giver. And she's carrying on at the feet of Jesus. And this goes on for a while. And then we read on. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this. Again, picture it in your mind. When you read scripture, don't race through it. Take time and, and 
allow yourselves, your imaginations that God gave you, to think about what's going on here. Dinner party, just going to have Jesus there, everything's nice, and this woman disrupts it, and it's this scene going on there. And when the Pharisee who had invited him to dinner saw this, he said to himself, huh, if this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Oh boy, we can be just like this guy, can't we? And we have to be very careful how we evaluate other people. Those outside the church and those inside the church because we are just as guilty of judgment. And Jesus says in Matthew 7, 1 and 2, do not, be, do not judge or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And I don't know about you, but I don't like being talked about. I'm sure I am, you know, because that's just what people do, regardless of who you are or what you do. <laughs> I talk about you all the time. I know you do. <laughs> Pharisee makes an if-then statement. If Jesus were really God, he would not tolerate this sinner touching him. If Mr. Jones were really rich, he wouldn't drive around in that cheap car. Yeah. If that pastor wasn't making great money, he wouldn't wear all those nice shirts. <laughs> but it was given to me. You know? <laughs> My mother used to dress like Diane that's usually over here. Diane always comes in fit, you know, just top to bottom. And um, I hope she didn't know I'm out here talking about her bottom. Uh, <laughs> struck me. <laughs> but you know, in the, in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, if you even watch old films, uh, when the women went out to shop, they, they got dressed nicely. You didn't go into the little downtown, even if you were from Mayberry, you put your, they, they put on their dresses and their their uh, costume jewelry. So my mother would dress like that for church because people dressed up in those days for church. And she you know, had the jewelry and the makeup and the hair. And and uh, I know one woman got to know her and she said, I'm, I'm really surprised at how down to earth you are because I really thought you were, you know, uh, you know stuck up or something. And, and, um, and my mother wasn't that way at all, but they judged her that way because she was just nicely dressed. And my mother didn't buy name products. She went to the bargain basements because she always said she'd rather have more of something. She didn't care about the label. She just, you know. Was. So uh, the way people judge people, I was judged for years as an entertainer, as a Christian. And they say, how can you be a Christian and be in show business? You know? And I saw more sinful behavior. I always say I've seen more messy situations as a pastor in the church than I ever saw backstage in 30 years of performing. So, well, and some of it's just because you're more closely associated with, with people. But some of it is because a lot of you are just playing messy. <laughs> so we're all guilty of making assumptions, and that's what this Pharisee does. Man, this guy was really came from God. And so we see in verse uh, 40, starting in verse 40, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Now here's the story we're getting to, finally. All this <laughs> message so far, and we're just getting to the story part. But it's very, very short. Jesus says, two men had owed money to a certain money lender. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he canceled the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? That's the story. Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Now it's interesting that this Pharisee is looking at Jesus and think, he can't be associated with God because he doesn't know just how sinful this woman is. And Jesus is hearing his thoughts about that and begins to address his thoughts by telling this story. <laughs> he knows as a son of God what Simon's thinking. He knows, what, he knows what's in our hearts. That's why when I pray, I don't hide anything from the Lord. Yeah. It doesn't matter how dirty or how weird 
or how any of the things that come into my head because I know he already knows. It's like trying to cover yourself in the shower thinking God could be watching. He knows. So he tells a story about two men that owe money. The columnist from years back, Earl Wilson, said, before borrowing money from a friend, decide which you need most. <laughs> and somebody else said, if you think nobody cares if you're alive, try missing a couple of car payments. <laughs> Don't raise your hand, but I'm going to ask you, anybody ever been haunted by a collection agency? Oh, yeah. oh Well, thank you for raising your hand, Georgiana. <laughs> you know how nasty they can be. Oh, yes, they do. We worked with them. I got to be friends with uh, people that were Christian. They were uh, in town for years named the Jolly Jovers. It was a husband and wife, English couple, that did a comedic acrobatic act. I mean, it was funny. She... And they both were very middle-aged looking, very middle-aged bodies, and she would get up on his shoulders. She'd have a little dress on and high heels and somehow wrap her leg. I mean, it was, you just had to be there. But they were in the Lido. They were in Hallelujah Hollywood that was at the original MGM. Then they were up in Reno back in the 70s and 80s at, uh, in a show called Hello, Hollywood Hello at the MGM up there. They made great money for years and years and years, and so much money because they worked so steadily in, in town here and up in Reno. They had several homes, they had a private plane, they lived it up. Then they got older and the, when the work began to diminish and, and it was so bad uh, that they, and they didn't have a great savings. So they ended up living with their 20 something year old daughter in her condo and they owed money. And they weren't working. In fact, they were buying little baby dolls and cleaning them up and going to flea markets and selling these dolls to survive. You know, it wasn't pretty. So Faye, again, being a middle-aged English lady, she was getting calls from the collection agencies. And somebody calls and they get rough with her and she, she says to them in her lovely little English accent, she said, they said, when can we expect payment? You know that, that line. She says, well, you see, we aren't working and we don't have any money. But when we begin to work again and get some money, we'll give some to you. <laughs> so the man said, well then when can we expect payment? And she fired back, I'm afraid you weren't listening. <laughs> <laughs> Not working, no money, don't have any when we get some. Anyway. The only man who sticks closer to you in adversity than a friend is a creditor. <laughs> so in Jesus' little story, these men owe money to a money lender. And like my friend Faye, they couldn't pay him back. A common laborer in Israel at that time would earn about a denarius a day. So the one owed 50 denarii, denarii plural, and the other owed 500 denarii. The one owed about a month and a half of salary, the other owed about a year and a half of salary. Now on top of this, this money lender they can't pay it back. He could have thrown them into debtor's prison and they would have stayed there until their families could come up with the money. And if you know that culture, though, the, if these men are married and have children, there was no way that a woman could earn money and pay it back. They, they were hopeless. They'd have been in prison and they'd have rotted there. And instead of doing this, this creditor says, I'm letting it all go. I'm letting it all go. You are not helpless anymore. And you can imagine the one who owed more. The gratitude. So it's obvious to this Pharisee, to Simon and to all of us, hearing Jesus' story, what the answer to that question is, who would love him more than the one forgiven the greater debt? But the story compares financial debt that we have no ability to pay with the heavy debt of sin before and against the Holy God that we have no ability to erase. And the irony is that regardless of the depth of your sin, like I said, there are good sinners and there are really good sinners. But all are sinners and only Jesus can forgive sin through his sacrifice. And the only difference between the man who owed 50 denarii and the man who owed 500 denarii 
and the Pharisee who's playing host to Jesus and this woman who has a reputation for living a sinful life. The only difference is that one of them recognized their need of Jesus and the value of what he did to buy their pardon. Now we conclude that portion of scripture in verse 44. So the man's questioning. And the man answers correctly that the one forgiven the most loves the most. And then in verse 44, he turned toward the woman, Jesus did, and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, for she loved much. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to this woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's close in prayer. Prepare our hearts to come to the communion table.